I'm Bill Brandon. I was born in Laidlaw Street, Tannerside. And like many other people from Tannerside, I have fond memories of the place. So much so that I set out to put on record some of the memories which I have of the places that formed Tannerside and Thornwood. Tannerside was demolished to make way for Caterpillar Tractor Company, this modern factory which has recently been demolished and you see the, the ruins here. I myself worked in Caterpillar in the purchasing department which was only yards from where I'm standing just now. Quite a number of local people were employed in Caterpillar and it was a blow to them when Caterpillar closed in 1987 throwing many of them on the unemployment register. Some of them took early retirement but a lot of them were never the same after this place closed. Down this road in the 17th century there stood a corn mill. This was a North Calder water mill where farmers from all around this area used to bring their corn to be thrashed into flour. Agriculture around this area was the only or at least the major source of industry albeit there was a weaving industry down the hill in Uddingston. This remained the situation until the advent of the coal mining industry. And with the coal mining industry, this created a need for housing for the workforce. The result of this being was houses were built down this road, Aikenhead Road, down in Newlands, also at Nackerty. These houses were built to accommodate the miners. Both these communities were demolished in the 1920s. Tanner site came after these houses were built. Just behind me here, was the site of Millgate Cottage and just beyond that was the community of Thornywood. Again beyond there was Tanner Side at the top of the hill. I would like to invite you to accompany me on a stroll into a bygone age. Let's say 1930s, 1940s and 1950s to what, give me a glimpse of what the place used to be like if you would like to accompany me Millgate Cottage few people would have known it by this name it was always referred to as Jimmy Forrest Jimmy was a local coal merchant and whilst coal was one and nine pence per hundredweight which is less than 10 pence present money. Many a housewife did not have enough money to buy a bag of coal when the coalman came round. By the time she did have, the coalman was gone, so she would send one of her boys to Jimmy's for a half a hundredweight to tide her over. The coal would be put into a rather heavy and awkward wooden barrel with two thin iron wheels and a T-shaped iron handle for pulling. Leaving Millgate, we immediately approached the start of Thornwood. This was where the first post office was run by a lady named Sally Scott, who was well known during the 39-45 war for collecting salvage material for the war effort. Here is Lee's Circle Bar. At the other end of this property was Bella Lair's wee sweetie shop. Thornwood United football team used a room at the back of this building as a dressing room. Their playing pitch was 100 yards behind it. 
This was when they were a juvenile team. To the rear, standing at right angles to it, stood a similar sized building called Lee's Lawn, or to give it its proper title, Lee's Land. Land in this context meaning tenement. Continuing our stroll, we come to the Free Church Aikenhead Hall, better known as the Band of Hope. Every Friday evening, this hall would be packed with children, singing with great gusto such popular evangelist hymns as Jesus Wants Me for a Sunbeam. The noise at times could be deafening. We are now passing the building which housed Young's the Cobbler. The name shown here is James McLean, but this was after it changed hands. The corner house was occupied by the McLean family, who at times used to hang a cage with a talking parrot in it outside the door. An amusing thing about this was that often when an attractive girl walked past, it would give out with a wolf whistle. <whistles> Behind this building, standing parallel to it, was another tenement building of equal size. This was called Young's Lawn. Carrying on for 100 yards or so, we come to the doctor's bungalow. The last one to occupy it was a Dr. John Cavern. Before him, going back to 1933, was a Dr. Douglas. This house stood immediately opposite the Tannerside Old Club. This was the entrance to the Caterpillar Tractor Factory, but before that was the site of where the local doctor's bungalow stood. Another minute takes us to Helen Care's drapery shop and post office. Helen and her husband started their business by going around the doors selling drapery items from a case. Next door was a chemist, but only the later residents got the use of it. It was a converted house and wasn't in use for long. The cafe we see here was up till shortly before the war, owned by a couple called Johnny and Cathy McNanny. It was then taken over by Louis and Della Bratisani and came to be known as Della's. Next door was another fish and chip shop owned by a Mrs. Patterson. That was all that lady sold. Adjacent to that came the cooperative baker's shop, although shown here as a library. The original library was in the miners' welfare until after the war. The local hostelry. Officially named the Alexandra, but that name was scarcely ever used. It was more often called Kilmartins, after the proprietor, or the brushers. Brushers were men who carried out a specific job down the pit. All these premises were directly across the road 
them the present miner's welfare. We will dip through the pen close here. From an upstairs vantage point, we see to our left the Nackerty Pit Bing. Below is a wash house. Switching our gaze to the right, we observe the gas tank and Tanner side number three pit bing. In the foreground, we also notice the west stretch of Hosier Street, which was known as the gas row, had already been demolished. close-up view of the pit bing and brickworks chimney. A start has been made in clearing this bing. Some of the waste was used to fill in the pit shaft, the remainder for making roads. Back through to Old Edinburgh Road. Here is a photo of the pub taken in 1917. But six yards beyond the pub is the pit manager's house. A further five or six yards takes us to the start of Russell Place. The first of the commercial premises here was a chemist. In pre-war days, the older type chemists made up their own medicines as per a doctor's prescription. This was such a one. Later on, it became a doctor's surgery. One of the doctors to use it was a very popular Dr. Angela Crawford. Adjoining that are two shops. The first was a sweetie shop owned by a Susie Kelly, with the back premises being used as a barber's. The barber's name was Willie Smiley, and an interesting thing about him was that on a Saturday, he employed a 12-year-old lad as a soap boy. His job was to soap the faces of the men waiting to be shaved. One of the last boys to do this was my older brother, Robert. Sharing the same common interest was a busy general provision shop owned by a Mr. Arthur Kelly, no relation to Susie, who had it from the late 1930s until the demolition in 1955. Before him, Chalmers had it as a newsagent. Turning left here, we enter the heart of the rose. Note the gas street lamp. This is Laidler Street. Even numbers on the left and odd numbers on the right. From about quarter of the way down the street, looking north, turning round to go back, we are now looking towards Urringson. I was born in a house to the left, number 29 Laidlaw Street. Now back out the continuation of Russell Place. No shops here, only the 16 houses. The Scobie family lived in the left-hand downstairs corner house, the Murphys, and the corresponding right-hand corner one.
Hosea Street now comes into view. Number one, Hosea Street, occupied by the McEwen family. The father, Rab, was well known as a caretaker of the miners' welfare. Right behind me here was number one, Hosea Street. The entrance to Tannaside Rose. Over my right shoulder, Centurion Brick Company. That was the site of the very heart of Tannaside Rose. Tannaside began its life during the coal mining boom in the latter part of the 19th century. The houses were built in a rectangle. with Hosier Street, which was built in 1870, forming three sides of it. Two rows of Laidler Street were then built in the centre in 1890. Russell Place was added alongside Old Edinburgh Road. This was in 1901. The old rows, as they were affectionately known, were demolished in 1955 to make way for the giant Caterpillar tractor plant, which was built in their place. Thornwood was affected in the very same way. Along this way is what remains of Russell Place. panoramic view of the rear of Hosier Street, we can take as a vantage point a Tannaside School west-facing window. From here we can see practically the whole stretch of the east side of the street, approximately 50 houses. Behind the houses can be seen the large gas tank. Then, in the distance, Nackerty Pit Bing. The rent of the houses before the war was about three shillings per week, which is the equivalent of 15 pence. It seems incredible now to think that many people at times would not have that sum when the rent man called. However, it ought to be remembered that a good number of miners suffered ill health because of their occupation and had to go on parish relief with all the consequences of that. Hosier Street on left looking towards Russell Place. This view could perhaps describe the rose on the days of the Pitt Gala Day, or more likely the Pitt Trip, when upwards to 40 buses would line up along Old Edinburgh Road and down into Laidler Street, waiting to take practically the whole population of Tannerside to the seaside. Of course, buildings themselves don't make a community. People do this. So let's meet some of the folks who lived in and around the rows. Apologies for the poor condition of some of the photographs. Football played a major part of entertainment. So first off, here is Tannaside Rovers, 
with their trophies they won in the late 1920s. The two towel men are Matt Hall and Harry Brandon, some of the officials being Jimmy Dobson, Huey Ferguson, Pat Gobraith and Nick Mulraney. Another one of the many teams in the area was Thornwood Rover Scouts. The line up here from left to right standing is John Jap, Harry Gardner, John Kerr, John Crichton, Andrew Galt, Robert Davy, Jim Davy, a lad named Finlayson. Front row, Alec Hutchison, Alex Shaw, A.N. Other, Jay McGowan, and Tom Crichton. A happy group of young children shown here with their backs to a wash house. Among them are four members of the McQuaid family, one holding a piece. Also is Ina Gray, Greta Murphy, Jackie Kelly, the boys Lockley, Bowes, Melrose, McLean and many others. Close-up of the soles of a young girl's shoes show her bare feet through a hole in them. Her better pair would be kept for school. Here we have a group of children from Young's Lawn, Thornywood. The picture is of very poor quality, but recognisable are Tom and James Dowdles in the middle of the front row. Also in the picture are the McCurdy sisters. This one is of myself, taken in 1929, sitting on my Aunt Sarah Devlin's lap. On the trike is my brother Robert. This was outside number 31 Laidlaw Street. Two years later, I have inherited the trike. Louis Petarelli's horse-drawn ice cream cart can be seen just past the big corner where the men would converge. Louis's cafe was in Oregston. A typical school photo of the time. This one is of me, Bill Brandon, taken at Tannerside School in 1936. Another one of myself, along with two wartime evacuees from Glasgow, who lived for a while with my Aunt Sarah at number 20 Hosier Street. This was in 1941, at the time of the Clyde Bank Blitz. Apologies for the poor condition of the photograph. Here are three Harry Brandons. The one in the middle is my father who lived at 29 Laidlow Street. The other two came from Thornywood. 
four men employed at Tannaside Pithead, from left to right standing, are Frank Burns, Robbie Fullerton, Andrew Bradley. Kneeling is Major Somerville. Unfortunately, this picture is in an extremely poor condition, which is a pity. It shows a happy group of adults at an outing. The location is unknown, but note the formal dress they are all wearing. The man on the right with the moustache is Mr. Barclay, who is choir master of the local choir. On his left, partly hidden, is Dennis Delaney. Near the centre, wearing dark glasses, is Agnes Kerr. picture of the Tannerside Harmonica Band that could boast upwards of 20 members along with their committee. The band's uniform consisted of black shirts with white pearl buttons and tartan ties, white trousers with red sashes and white shoes. The trophy on display at the front was awarded to them for being second in a national band competition held in the Queen's Theatre, Glasgow. Among the many Will Kent faces here are Jory Burns, the local street bookie, Jim Patterson, banjo player Eddie Bradley, county councillor Bob McCracken, McCracken Drive in View Park is named after him, Andy Murphy, Bobby Evans, the band leader, Paddy Burns, pit manager Jimmy Davis, and Mr. Masterton, headmaster of Tannerside School. Viewers will no doubt recognise others. This one is an absolute gem. At least 150 locals taken at the annual Pitt Christmas dance in Tannerside Miners Welfare in 1938. Obviously there are far too many names to mention them all, but some are Ellen Kerr, Robert Murphy, Mary Brandon, James Murphy, Mary Murphy, Jesse Connor, Angus Young, Tommy Saunders, and many, many more. A truly splendid picture to depict a reminiscence of people. Here is someone who attended that same dance, Mrs. Mary Main, taken shortly after her marriage in 1946. Like a lot of other young married couples, she and her husband Bobby had to start married life living in someone's room until they could get a house of their own. A squad of workers taking a break at Tannerside Brickworks. Names that can be put to some of the faces are Joe Burns, Johnny McGowan, Jimmy Tennant and Bobby Russell. Apologies again for the poor condition of the photo. But as with some of the other pictures, I felt that the subject matter makes them worth showing. We are now coming to the end of our stroll, after making our acquaintance with some of the people who put the heart into the rose, we take our leave by exiting from the top of Hosier Street. Continuing along Old Edinburgh Road we pause just long enough 
to take a last lingering backward look over her shoulder. What we see is a superb view of Russell Place stretching back to the pit manager's house. We could be forgiven, perhaps, if some of us have a tear in our eye as we bid a fond farewell to fair Tanner's side as we say thanks for the memories. <laughs>